got her Ph. degree from Harvard School of Public Health in 1971 and has been on the faculties of the University of Washington and the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center since 1973. Dr. Wise has been a leader in cancer epidemiology research for decades, both for his original research and his advances in research methodology. At present, his research focuses on cancer screening and a variety of areas unrelated to cancer. From 1984 until 1993, Dr. Wise served as the chair of the Department of Epidemiology at the University of Washington, where under his leadership, the department saw substantial growth in both faculty and student numbers. Dr. Wise has taught extensively at the University of Washington, has given lectures on the methods and applications of epidemiology elsewhere at the university, I mean, elsewhere in the US and around the world, and has authored three books related to epidemiologic methods. Over the course of his career, he has overseen the research of hundreds of graduate students and has been the recipient of awards for teaching and mentoring from the University of Washington and from the Congress of Epidemiology. I'd like to close with remarks from two of Dr. Wise's former students. Dr. Robert Whitaker, professor of public health and pediatrics at Temple University said, Noel helped me to understand that epidemiology like, me like medicine was an integration of art and science. He manifested in his teaching both a confident certainty and a humble uncertainty about what truths epidemiology could reveal. That paradox of at once knowing and not knowing has remained with me in my teaching and practice of epidemiology. And lastly, Dr. Deanne Lazovich, Associate Professor, University of Minnesota, who wrote in his nomination letter for the 2011 Congress of Epidemiology Teaching Award, said, Dr. Wise is renowned for providing lifetime career advice and guidance to his former students. He remains a key advisor, generous colleague, and inspiring role model in our lives and work. Thanks to the successful mentoring we have received from Dr. Wise, he is the consummate role model for how we can each be better teachers, advisors, and mentors to epidemiologists in training as they pursue their professional careers. I am privileged to introduce the recipient of the 2017 Abraham Lillian, uh, Lillianfeld Award winner, Dr. Noel Wise. Uncertainty and humble uncertainty. <laughs> <laughs> um, for better or for worse, it character, does characterize a lot of what I, say, what I say in classes and elsewhere. And I'm sure many students are kind of confused by the combination of those two things. But in, within epidemiology, as all of you know who practice it, that's what life is all about. Um, I, in my couple of minutes, I want to acknowledge two of my forebears in epidemiology. One is Abraham Lillingfeld himself. Um, who I knew just a little bit. Um, he was a uh, leading uh, epidemiologist in the 20th century, um, had a uh, long, time, uh, long time chair of the Johns Hopkins uh, Department of Epidemiology, and many contributions outside of uh, strictly teaching research. He was the, instrument, the leading figure in the creation of the Society for Epidemiologic Research. Um, as I said, I knew him just a little bit. My longtime colleague in Seattle, David Thomas, was a student of his and also a junior faculty member there. And uh, it reports to me that William Feld as a person um, was as good or better than he was as an epidemiologist, saying a lot. Uh, it's really quite an honor for me to get an award in his name. The other person I want to uh, mention is uh, William Feld's counterpart, the chair of epidemiology at Harvard for that same period that William Abe was at Hopkins, this is a Brian McMahon. Um, uh, I studied under him. He was a classroom teacher of mine and an advisor. When I was at Harvard, I had a very vague and unformed interest in public health. 
and by his example, a very positive example, especially as a classroom teacher, although he was an excellent advisor as well, I figured, well, that might be a, that might be a career path that I could follow. Well, I've been on that career path for more, well, between 40 and 50 years now, and I will say that I've never regretted being on it. So it's been a real, quite a privilege. Um, role, role models are important, and I've uh, tried to emulate a man in being that kind of role model. I want to thank him, relatedly, and thanking the section for this award. I'm going to be quite honored. Thank you. in Detroit, Michigan, and is a public health advocate whose research exposed the Flint water crisis. Her research revealed that children were exposed to dangerous levels of flint of lead in Flint, Michigan. Uh, Dr. Mona fell in love with pediatrics while in Flint campus during her clinical years as a medical student at Michigan State University's College of Human Medicine. After completing her residency and chief residency at Children's Hospital of Michigan, she earned a master's degree in public health, concentrating in health management and policy at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Um, she was assistant professor at Wayne State University Department of Pediatrics and an associate director of the Children's Hospital in Michigan Pediatric Residency Program. In addition to educating the next generation of physicians, Dr. Hannah Atisha now directs the Michigan State University and Hurley Children's Hospital Public Health Initiative and an innovative and model public health program to research, monitor, and mitigate the impact of lead in Flint's drinking water. She is doing this work in Hurley because of its dedicated and renowned pediatric faculty, its energetic and committed residents, and the opportunity to improve pediatric public health in the greater Flint, Michigan area, in the greater Flint area. Her academic interests include quality of care, addressing disparities in care, health policy and advocacy, and pediatric education, especially the incorporation of technology and online education. Dr. Hannah Tisha has received numerous honors, including being a Time 100 Influential Person of the Year, the Michigan State Medical Society of Public Health Leadership Award, the American Pediatric Association Michael Shannon Research Award, the National Center for Health Research Health Policy Hero Award, the National Head Start Hero Award, the Chaldean Chamber of, Chamber of Commerce Humanitarian of the Year Award, and the American Academy of Pediatrics Presidential Award. Unfortunately, Dr. Mona could not be here today, but fortunately, Dr. Deborah Fur Holden who is director of the Public Health Division at Michigan State University, is here to give remarks and accept this award on behalf of Dr. Mona Hanna-Tisha. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Flor Holden. I always joke, Dr. Mona, I call her America's favorite pediatrician. How many people got to see or know who Dr. Mona Hana Atisha is? I mean, when I tell you she is somebody to be God awful proud of, I can't imagine what it must be like to be her, her mother, right? Because here she is, and, and, and for those of you who work with physicians, I'll tell you pediatricians are a special breed of physician. They tend to be very, very fierce advocates. They look at the children in the cities that they serve as their children, and Dr. Mona is no exception. 
you want to know when she did what she did. And I don't know, anybody see the Lifetime movie Flint that just came out? It came out last um, Saturday and it aired on Lifetime and the movie is literally called Flint. She said Detroit, Dr. Mona is in Flint with us in Flint, all of her work happens in Flint. Um, but anyway, pediatricians tend to be very fierce advocates. When Dr. Mona um, started to get, because she doesn't actually live in the city of Flint, but all of her work and her heart and her passion is in the city of Flint. When parents were coming into the clinic and saying, you know, something is off with our water. I'm wondering if this is making any kind of difference with our kids. And she said, well, let's find out. Let's see if there's anything that's showing up on any of their top screens or any of those things that we can identify that might be making a difference. When I tell you, she put herself out there, right? She's got an MPH, so yeah, she's sort of a physician researcher, but she's really, really a clinical care person. The state literally attacked her. We were in a city where it was known by many. Everybody except the governor of Michigan has been indicted on criminal charges. People died as a function of what they faced in the Flint water crisis. And Dr. Mona, not our health officer, who has since resigned, not our uh, chair of our board of health, not anybody from environmental quality, not anybody from um, the state, not anybody from our state Department of Health and Human Services. This little teeny, I mean, she's like this little tiny little lady was the one who held the press conference. There were people at Michigan State, the person that served in my role as the division director for the unit where Dr. Mona works said, I think this is a bad idea. He didn't even come. He said, I think this is a bad idea. And then the state tried to discredit her. And lo and behold, what we found out was her data and her numbers were exactly the same as the state. But you know, there's uh, lies, lies, and then there's statistics. What the state did is they used as the denominator zip codes. And about half, if you know anything about zip codes, about half of the zip codes that are within the city of Flint, half of that same zip code also falls outside of the city of Flint. And hence, it's not on Flint municipal water. For a group like us, that's just like a no-brainer, duh, ecological <laughs> policy, right? So when you weight down the denominator, you weight down the extent of the problem. And so it was Dr. Mona who said, no, it shall be, we shall know the truth, we shall do it with data. And she got attacked for it, people came for her, she was not very um, liked by the state and by the city, but the citizens of Flint really appreciate and respect and deeply honor um, Dr. Mona for both her courage and her bravery. So for you to honor her with a public health practice award is like, you got it right. Mm -hmm. She's somebody who's worth bearing any kind of award that APHA, or for that matter, any other organization we give. Dr. Mona has not benefited personally one dime from what has happened out of the Flint water crisis. She created a fund called the Flint Kids Fund. And people don't know this because she won't tell it because it's just not who she is. But every dollar that she's received, she won an award um, from an organization called the Disobedience Award. It came with a $250,000 cash award. Dr. Mona has donated every dollar that has come to her from notoriety from the Flint water crisis to something called the Flint Kids Fund. She has personally not benefited one dime. She says, I'm just doing my job. You shouldn't get paid extra just to do your job. So I just want you guys to know how amazing she is. And I asked Bishop, Bishop Jefferson to come up with me because um, we've now been awarded uh, the Flint-led exposure registry grant from the um, ATSDR at the CDC. It's the uh, Substances and Toxic, tox, toxic Substances Disease, Disease Registry um, at the CDC. So we're gonna make sure that um, we get to rewrite the narrative not the past, we can't rewrite the past, but we're gonna write a very positive narrative moving forward, because we know the impact of lead and some of these other um, waterborne illnesses on our residents. And we also know what we can do to mediate those impacts. And the lead registry will give us an opportunity to do that, to track people, coordinate their care, do long-term monitoring and evaluation, and make sure that our great public health interventions are really taken hold. So I'd like to have Bishop Jefferson just speak of, for a bit from the community perspective, because the other thing that we have in Flint is nothing about us without us. 
We don't do it to community. We do it with and in partnership with community. So Dr. Mona said, Bishop Jefferson got a scholarship from the community caucus and she's going to APHA. Take her to the award ceremony so they can hear from community as well. So you can give her a hand too because without her, Dr. Mona doesn't have the kind of support she needs. Thank you so much. I count it an honor and a privilege to be here today. And I count it an honor and a privilege to know Dr. No Dr. Mona because truly she has worked with the community. And I'm a stickler for de definition. Mm -hmm. And I looked up what an epidemiologist <laughs> was and what they did. <laughs> and it said it had a particular group of people, population. And that population is Flint, Michigan. And had it not been because the community, the grassroots organizations, they kept screaming and kept hollering, telling that there is a problem with the water. There is a problem with our children. There is a problem at the school. There is a problem in hospital. When people were dying and getting sick, nobody would listen to the community. But there was one woman that did the research on a particular population. And that population was Flint and our children, our babies, that the lead level was too high, even for them to, to learn in school. It was too high for them to function normally. And the problem is now, is that we don't know what the effect will be five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now. But I was asked to be on the board as a consultant to make sure that they consider our community and many times we think about our youth zero to six years old but it affected our whole community and that's what these dollars are being used for this next generation is to consider the whole youth and the whole population not just a segment but the whole population and so our people are important and if we don't take time to make somebody stand up and recognize take time to know that there is a population of people that need to be helped. And Dr. Mona Hanatisha is one of those people that said, I care enough that if I'll lay my title, my life, and my work on the line to stand up for people that I care about and that I love. And for that love and honor and respect, we have love and honor and respect, Dr. Mona Hanatisha. And we want to say thank you for your recognition. Mm -hmm. Because she said, I don't want, if they make the check to me, I got to pay taxes on it, then I got to donate and all that. I know for a fact, because I know her. She actually gave the commencement address at Hopkins School of Public Health, of which I'm an alum, and Abe Lillianfeld wasn't there when I was there, but I studied in the Lillianfeld Library in Hopkins for <laughs> This check is made to the Michigan State University um, College of Human Medicine, and it goes to attention Julie Barrett from the Pediatric Public Health Program, because she's the one that manages all the checks. So Mona's name is not on this check because she refuses it. She's like, I, this is my job. I'm not. You don't have to pay me extra for doing my job. Tell a friend. That's who the, who who our girl is. Okay. <laughs> okay. One of the salient points that we always try to stress, especially in the epidemiology section here at APHA, is the role that not only we're responsible for uh, tracking diseases and being uh, good stewards with the data, but that we also have that social responsibility 
uh, to our communities and uh, of course a public health practice award tries to typify that. So once again, thank you. Our next award is a significant award within the field of public health and epidemiology and we're very honored to be the one organization to uh, provide this award called the John Snow Award uh, with the uh, sanction and the auspices and the co-sponsorship of the World Society of Public Health who will be also uh, presenting some words as well. You see, if you don't know anything about epidemiology, there's this gentleman by the name of, uh, gentleman, person by the name of John Snow, uh, who was responsible for, uh, we would say, uh, the, gen the genesis of our field. Uh, John Snow, as you, those who don't know, helped to curtail a cholera outbreak uh, in London at the time by not only tracking where uh, diseases were occurring, uh, in its proximity to this water pump, but identifying the water pump and the water, the contaminated water, as the uh, potential source and took the handle off. Simple intervention. Took the handle off and was able to stop the spread of illness within that uh, auspicious story. I was in London and Dr. Kramer was a little upset with me and I didn't say hi, but I found my way to the John Snow pub because there's a pub in London uh, with the John Snow. Uh, uh, there's tons of uh, images of John Snow and the pump handle and the location is also uh, supposed to be right outside. They moved the pump, if I'm not mistaken, and moved to a, a museum. I was disappointed, but I did sit down for a, a pint, as you say. <laughs> <laughs> Our next awardee is Dr. Tyler Vanderbilt. He's a professor of epidemiology at the Harvard School of Public Health. He holds degrees in mathematics, philosophy, theology, finance and biostatistics from the University of Oxford, the University of Pennsylvania, and Harvard University. His research principally concerns methodology for distinguishing association and causation in the social and biomedical sciences. He's done empirical research in perinatal, genetic, psychiatric epidemiology throughout the social sciences and most recently in studying religion and health, including the study of the role of religion and spirituality in end-of-life care and of the mechanism governing the associations between religion and health is a grant from the Templeton Foundation.